Well, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, I was noticing on the uh, internet news last night that uh, there's a big flap about a, a new movie that's coming out uh, about Jesus and his uh, family and his wife and, I don't know, children or whatever. And uh, I'm sure that there are uh, lots of uh, religious people that uh, are thinking, oh, that's good stuff. And I hope you're not one of them. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there are uh, lots of people gathering in so-called Christian churches this morning across this country um, who probably think they are Christians, but number one, don't know anything about salvation. Um, church to them is a traditional enterprise. Um, uh, for the preachers, it's a profession. And uh, it makes no real practical difference in my life. It's something I do, but it doesn't change my life. And I hope that's not your way of thinking. There are many things that we must separate ourselves from, right? There are many, many things we need to separate ourselves from. Uh, there is uh, no biblical Christianity without the doctrine of personal separation and that is our theme for the next few weeks uh, talking about the doctrine of separation we introduced it last week and we'll review a little bit of what we talked about from the nation israel as a an illustration of uh, of that fact you know nothing could be further from god's mind and heart and the intent of the scriptures than to have uh, you know practicing homosexuals openly flaunting their um, uh, disobedient lifestyle and having church fellowships where uh, you know homosexuals and lesbians can go to church and be known as Christians and uh, and to be moral immoral uh, practicing such a lifestyle right and there are Christian homosexual churches in uh, Toronto New York San Francisco and many other places in the country I was reading last night about a, a woman who uh, who ended a lesbian relationship that she was in and the judge awarded her custody of the daughter. I don't know where the daughter came from. Certainly didn't come from that relationship. Uh, but anyway, they there was a daughter involved in this relationship and the judge gave... This woman ended the relationship because she became a Christian. And she immediately separated herself from the lesbian relationship that she was in. And uh, there was a court fight, and the judge said that she could have custody of the child, shared custody of the child, just so long as she never, ever said anything homophobic or did anything homophobic uh, to that child. The child was adopted. Was it? And so here is a Christian woman who is uh, being gagged, you know, about sin uh, if she wants to see this child. Amazing stuff, eh? And she did the right thing in separating herself from sinful lifestyle once becoming a Christian. We are absolutely called upon as Christians. It's not uh, so much a choice as a responsibility. It is a choice, but it is an absolute responsibility that when... We call ourselves Christians, we become saved, when we name the name of Jesus Christ, that a host of things change in our lives, right? And uh, God does his share of those inner realities. He justifies us, he reconciles us, God is propitiated for us, he redeems us, he regenerates us, he washes us, he implants his spirit, he gives us righteousness, he transfers us into the kingdom of his dear son, but he calls us to conversion. That's a change of direction. And he calls us to repentance. That's a change of mind. Right? He calls us to a, a life separated from sin. And I believe that it's um, impossible to please God without uh, living a separated life. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7 is one of the major passages in the New Testament um, that challenges Christians to a separated lifestyle, and I want us to focus on that in our study this morning. I want to start with chapter 5, and I want to read 
an extended section here, starting with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, or 14. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he, referring to Christ, died for all, in order that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself, that means thoroughly changed us, by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That means that as we witness, God changes other people through our testimony. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We beg you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, and Paul is referring to himself as a Christian minister, as an apostle, and probably including the Corinthians to whom he's writing as fellow workers in the ministry. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For, he says... I have heard you in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And how is it that we do not receive the grace of God in vain? This is how. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. So our lifestyle affects our ministry. By in all things, commending ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Let's just stop there for a moment. What Paul has done in the passage that we've read is he has reminded us that we are saved by the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, right? Jesus dies on the cross. He pays the penalty for our sin. He makes it possible for God in heaven to change us, to reconcile us thoroughly, to give his righteousness to us, right? To make a whole new creature out of us. And then when we are made a new creature, the logical progression is that we then join God in his earthly enterprise of helping other people get saved and themselves to be changed, right? That's called the ministry of reconciliation. That is what we are all co-workers with. I was thrilled with the testimony that was shared with me. I guess it was uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we were in southern Ontario um, Tuesday night, all of Wednesday and Thursday morning to attend a funeral of a dear friend. And, and I had a real nice visit with a man that used to be my Sunday school teacher when I was about this big. His name was Elwood Morrison. And uh, he's really gone through uh, some tremendous 
um, experiences in his Christian odyssey and uh, for many years walked away from God and now he is pastoring a church um, in southern Ontario and um, God is really using that man as a witness. He witnesses to his neighbors and his friends and his co-workers. He used to be a Z-Bart guy and now he runs a ranch uh, selling horses and, and cattle and or trying to sell the cattle and uh, he was telling me about a, a guy that he's tried to lead to the Lord, witness to for a couple of years. This guy would have absolutely nothing to do with it. And his wife came, knocked on his door just as he was getting ready to come to the funeral on uh, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon. She was in tears at his door and she said, what's going on? And he said, uh, she said that her, her husband just called her from prison in um, Ohio he had gone down on a business trip and he had uh, made arrangements over the internet to meet this lady to make a sales pitch for some enterprise that he's involved in. When he met the lady, the FBI handcuffed him and took him directly to jail and impounded his car. <laughs> totally unexpected. He doesn't have any idea, she doesn't have any idea what's going on, but this guy finally is reading his Bible and he, call, he, guess he got, got to make one phone call from jail. He called his wife and said, tell Elwood to keep praying for me. Uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm okay. He says, I'm reading my Bible. Well, he would never have admitted to reading his Bible. He was not interested. He had turned away from it, you see? And what a witness. What God does amazing things <laughs> to get a hold of people. You know, Elwood is a pretty exciting guy. I, I just love listening to stories like that. This is, this is an ongoing thing in his life right now as we speak today. He's, he's got a ministry of reconciliation. He's in full-fledged embracing this ministry. You know something? You and I could be seeing stuff like that happen in our lives. We just open our mouths. Right? If we are saved, as uh, Pastor Wood said Friday night here, you know, we are supposed to be witnessing for Jesus. It's supposed to be in our blood. It's supposed to be the essence of who we are. We're supposed to be reaching out to people. It's supposed to be a vibrant thing. It's supposed to be number one on the list, right? And I can tell you I've lived with conviction for many years in my life, and it's been a struggle for me to come to the place where it's, you know, I'm much closer to the standard than I ever was before in this, in this whole area of being a witness and being open with my faith and, faith and talking to people about the Lord and overcoming my fears and, and being concerned about the lifestyle I live and the way I treat people being consistent with the profession that comes out of my mouth, right? That's the, that's the whole challenge right there. And so Paul is saying here, we are saved by the grace of God. He makes us a totally new person. He gives us a job to join him to reach out to the lost people in this world. Everything we do in our ministry, we are workers together with God, and that necessitates solemn choices in our lives. And everything in that list from verses 3 to 10 is a contrast to the world. Every one of those things has an opposite. Are you honorable or dishonorable? Are you pure or impure? Are you knowledgeable or ignorant? Are you willing to suffer or are you running from pain? Are you giving no offense or have you ruined your testimony by your lack of a godly reputation? And everything in that list there is there because it defines a separated Christian lifestyle that's consistent with being a minister for Jesus Christ. And you don't have to be a preacher. And for fewer people are preachers than they are non-preachers. And yet God expects us all with our gifts, our varied gifts, to be witnesses for him. You get the point. That's the logic here in this passage. Chapter 5 is salvation. Chapter 6 is ministry and service. And he continues. He stops at this point and he says to the Corinthians in verse 11, O ye Corinthians. Now I'm reading from, uh, let's see, I'll read it from the King James and then I'll read it from, uh, what have I got? New Schofield Reference Bible. This is what the King James says in verses 11 to 13. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open to you, our heart is enlarged. You are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak unto you as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. 
That's pretty obtuse language. Let me read it in a clarified explanation here. O ye Corinthians, our speech to you is candid, straightforward. Our heart is wide open. On our part, there is no constraint, but there is constraint in your affections. In fair exchange, I speak as unto my children. Open wide your hearts to us. He's making an appeal. He says, I'm trying to be completely honest with you, and I'm trying to talk to you Christians. And he says to them, 56 AD, he writes to them and he says, but I know that as I'm trying to minister to you, you've got all your fences up. You've got a barrier here. You don't want to listen to what I got to say to you. You've got your feathers ruffled and you're just, you're not cooperating here. And I want you to, you know, Open up here and let me talk to you. Let me come across to you. And what is it he wants to say to them? Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel, an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? What is the answer to all those questions? None. That's right. Absolutely none. The answer is a big fat no to each one of those. Let's read it that way. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? None. You give me the answer. And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Why? Because you are the temple of the living God. As God has said... I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. This is a quotation from the Old Testament. It applied to Israel. God dwelt in the midst of the nation in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, right? Between the cherubim on the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant behind the veil in the holy place and the whole nation lived around there in the wilderness and then when they moved into the country of Israel, the temple was there and God was supposed to dwell in their midst, right? And they were all to come there and fellowship with God at the three great feasts of the year, right? At all times, God was the center. And he says that hasn't changed that much, much in principle except that every one of us is a little temple now, right? You are the temple. I am the temple of the living God. And he repeats this, and this is just a repetition of what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Verses 19 and 20. What? Do you know, do not know that your temple is the... that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That you are not your own? You've been bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God dwells within us. This is His living, dwelling place on earth. God says, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Now, if that be the case, God doesn't want His temple in a compromised position. So verse 17, he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And that was his uh, opening premise for extending the argument through chapter 7, but it's sort of like a conclusion to everything that he said in, in this section in 6.11 to 18. So, come out from among them and be ye separate. The doctrine of separation is a thoroughly biblical doctrine. It's not a theological doctrine. It's not something preachers infer from the Scripture. It's something blatantly stated right out of the Scriptures themselves. And it's written not to Israel. It's written to the church. Okay? So, this doctrine of separation is commanded to Christians. It's 
blatant, it's direct, it's our individual and collective responsibility. It's my job, and it's yours. And I've tried to put it in its context this morning that it's fitting and reasonable for us to practice separation in our personal lives, in our families, in our marriages, in our workplace, in our churches. It's fitting because of what God has done in our lives, right? He saves us. So here we are going to hell with all the other sinners, right? We fit the crowd. We're with the crowd. And he goes and he pricks, picks us up, turns us around, goes poof, touches us with his magic wand, turns us from frogs into princes and princesses, right? Takes us and sets us on the high road and we're going the opposite direction to heaven with a different crowd. And he says, now I want you to walk with those people instead of walking with those people. Go a different direction with a different crowd. Be different, right? And you are, while you're going to heaven with God's people, you are to mingle with these people and be a witness to them so that you can help change them, help me change them, right? But be different, be different. Let me read you or explain to you the, um, the verbs here the three imperative verbs used in this section. In verse 14, he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Present imperative. This present imperative always has the idea of continuous action. Continually stop being unequally yoked together. This is a continuous responsibility. We are never to slip into an unequal yoke. We're constantly, throughout every day of our Christian experience until we're raptured, to be, um, to not be something. Continually not be. Okay. To be unequally yoked. There's two words for being different in the Greek New Testament. One is alos and one is heteros. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the gifts. You know, there's different kinds of gifts, right? One has this gift, another person has a different kind of a gift. And he constantly plays on the distinct difference between those two adjectives. One, is, uh, one has this kind of a gift, another has a different kind of gift. Heteros means different, a different time, different, completely different, different in nature, different kind. Alos means another sort of in a similar way, okay? And he uses this word heteros joined with yoke together. Do not ever be, continually be separating yourselves from a different, you know, uh, continually be differently, let me restate that, be not unequally yoked. Do not be yoked together with people who are different from you is the literal way to put it. Do not be yoked with people who are different specifically with unbelievers. And then he uses in verse 17 a different verb. He says, come out from among them. You know, in the last 10 years, uh, we've seen uh, kind of like um, social vomitation taking place in our culture. You know, all the... Uh, the homosexuals, you know, are coming out of the closet, you know, the closet door bangs open and all the vomit comes out. That's a graphic picture of coming out, right? The septic tank blew off the septic tank, stuff came out of there, right? And that's, that's what we're having here. This is come out, and it's an aorist imperative. It's an act. It means just like Sven Robinson came out of the closet 10 years ago, as a practicing homosexual, and he came right under the public and told everybody, this is what I am, and this is what I believe, and he's been spewing his garbage all over this country for the last 10 years, and making it almost illegal for me to say anything about it in this, you know what I mean? Like, these people have come out. Well, it's time for Christians to come out. All right? It's time for Christians to come out. This is an act. This is an open act. This is something everybody sees. And God says, come out from among them. If people don't know you're a Christian, you haven't come out. You're still a closet Christian. I'll say it bluntly. If people you work with do not know that you're a Christian, 
If you do not openly practice your Christianity, you have not come out. You have not made that decision. This is an aorist imperative, and it means uh, just do it. Open the door, kick it open, and come out. You know what you need to pray? Pray and ask God to help you just do it. And just let him, uh, let, the, let the chips fall where they may, but it's your job and it's my job to kick that door open and come out. Say something to people. Even if you have to say something like, you know, I've worked with you guys for X number of years and I'm ashamed to say that I am a Christian and I never really told you. And what I'm telling you today, I want you to know, <laughs> right? You may have to say it like that. You may have to eat crow. You may have to give yourself a black eye, but you need to come out. You do need to come out. And it's an act. It's not something you keep doing. Once you do it, you don't have to do it ever again. Right? Because they know then, you see, come out. And then the next verb is, be ye separate. This is actually a passive aorist imperative. Be ye separated. And the verb means to mark off a boundary, to limit and to separate. Literally, this means you need to draw a line in the sand and cross the line and be separated from the people on this side of the line. You have to cross that line. When you come out, you are crossing a line, an open line, a visible line in the sand that you will not cross back over that line again. I am not going to be like I once lived. And it's an aorist passive imperative to be literally become separated by crossing the line. And then he says in the same verse, the third one, and touch not the unclean thing. This is a present imperative. And, it, and it's just like um, uh, be not unequally yoked. Stop being always yoked up with people who are different. Stop going down the road like that. Stop being all the time like that. Rather, he says, be different. Make an act across the line. Come out. Open the, open the door and be different. And then he says, stop touching the unclean thing. Present imperative. Stop fastening yourself to. Stop adhering to. Stop clinging to unclean things. Stop having carnal intercourse with unclean things. Um, this is, a, this is an, a reference to a verse actually in the book of Isaiah. I'll read it. Isaiah 52. Join me there if you want. Isaiah 52 verse 11. In a completely different context. You know, most of us are good at talking about anything but the real thing, right? I don't know about you, but I... Uh, I catch myself, well, let me back up a little bit. I used to be really shy. I, I still have shyness in me, and I had to work at it over the years. Uh, while we were down in southern Ontario, we met uh, people, you know, related to Nathan Bigney that I, we'd never met before. He had, one of his, he had 11 children, and uh, one of his daughters came to the funeral, and uh, from... Las Vegas and I'd never met her before and her husband and so I really enjoyed sitting there and just visiting with these people and getting to know them talk about everything under the sun right I never witnessed to them directly although I did, they were there at the funeral and I said a few words so they did get the message right uh, but I could talk with them about everything I just I've cultivated that that ability to talk with people about just what I get them talking about themselves that's a real key if you're a shy person just ask somebody how they're doing they'll fill the conversation everybody likes to talk about themselves right right so you can break the break the, the barriers between no conversation by asking somebody a, a leading question they'll they'll talk about themselves right and you'll find something in common that you can talk about right or at least you can ask questions to find out you know that you'll learn stuff Right, so I I I do this all the time. I love to meet people. I love to talk to people. Now, where was I going with this? Eh? Isaiah 
Yeah, I know, Isaiah 52. Oh yeah, we can talk to anybody about the weather, we can talk about sports, we can talk about politics, we can talk about anything, but talk about, talk about Jesus. What's, hey, can we talk about Jesus? That's where we got to develop the skill. And Isaiah 52, someday, uh, 52, 11. I'll read it. Isaiah said, Depart ye, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Verse uh, 9 and 10, we need to read the context. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. What's that talking about? It's talking about the second advent. Jesus Christ comes out of heaven, he separates the nations, right? The sheep from the goats, right? He bears his holy arm in judgment, and he says to his people, he says, come out from the wicked nations. Don't go in there with those people because they're going to get my judgment. And be clean that bear the vessels, the holy vessels of the Lord. And so he calls upon the saved of Israel, the redeemed of his people, to separate themselves in the day of judgment. He's going to actually help them separate themselves. Now that verse is taken by Paul and it amplified and adapted to Christians in our relationships with unsaved people. And he says, come out. Don't touch the unclean things. Stop touching it. Stop clinging to it. You know something? This is where 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 comes in because John says to Christians, he says, love not the world. Stop loving the world. Stop loving the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of God, not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away and the fashion thereof. Right? We, in theory, convince ourselves, well, I'm not worldly. I'm separated. I don't. And we can always find somebody that we're not as bad as, right? I never committed murder. You know, I never did this. I never, I don't do that, right? I'm not a, you know, I don't go to Studio 10, right? So I separate myself from, yeah, but what do you watch on television? Television. What, what? I got a little French in me. Uh, what, in, what, what videos do you rent to watch? All right? Uh, what about your speech? All right? What about your mind? How pure are you anyway? All right? Uh, how do you dress? What music do you listen to? You know, who are, who are your friends and do they know that you're a Christian? Now, you start asking questions like that. And by the way, what did you spend money on this week? All right? And what is the passion that drives you? What are you living for? And if you love this world, how do you know you love this world? Well, how about you, do you love the things of this world? What are you willing to give up? Did you give anything away this week? Any material things? Did you give anything away this week? People who love their things don't give them away. They collect and they hoard, but they don't give it away. Right? They don't, certainly don't share and they certainly don't give, right? Because they love it, right? Or if they give, they always give away what's garbage to them because they got something much better, right? Okay? Now, loving this world is, you know, it's the opposite of living a separated life. And so when, when Paul says in 2 Corinthians, you know, what fellowship, what, what do we sh as righteous people share with, what do we have in common with unsaved people? We don't have a lot in common. We have to work, yeah. Got to make money, yep. Got to pay your bills, yep. Right, you got to drive a car, yep. Right, you got you to gotta do these things. You have to live. We are in the world, but he says, don't be of it. That's John says that. What, what communion has light with darkness, right? Where, do you, where have you drawn the line in the sand? Let me ask you. Do you know in your mind where the line is that you will not cross? Have you ever thought about that concept? I will not do this. Do you have any convictions as a Christian? And do you love the things of this world? And so it's the things of this world, it's Hollywood, it's TV, it's materialism, it's 
my own private life, it's, uh, you know, entertainment, it's styles, it's music, it's dress, it's a lot of things. And the world has its ways. And where have you drawn the line and said, I will not go there? Because if you haven't drawn that line, then you have not become separated. Because that's what becoming separated is. It means drawing a line and getting on the other side of it. Right? It means coming out openly. And I want to challenge you this morning, you know, to be willing to be different. The whole culture is like a vice trying to conform you. Right? To dress, think, act, and behave and spend your money. You know, the whole fashion industry is is pressure-oriented to make you conform so that you... When was the last time you uh, decided to uh, wear something that wasn't in? <laughs> or wear a, higher, a hairstyle that isn't in? Who says you have to watch the latest movies when they come out? Just because they're advertising the latest movies, why not draw a line in the sand and say, okay, I'm not even going to bother renting that movie. I'm not going to go to the show and watch it. I'm just going to be different. I'm going to be different from all the people that are running like ants after the sugar water, right? And going and being polluted by the latest movie. I'm going to not do that. I'm going to draw a line in the sand. Hey? Eh? Now, I'm, I've been a little bit facetious here this morning in some cases to just to try to get you to think about stuff. Right? The doctrine of separation is not about wearing black and white clothes with a black tie. It's not wearing certain kinds of head coverings. That is part of the doctrine, right? But I'm telling you, God says the real enemy is the world. John says it's the world. And it's the love of the age. And it's the love of the age's things, right? And it's being in the world, learning how to be in but not of, right? And all these words described cleansing and purity and being holy and, and separated and, and uh, doing a thorough cleaning in our lives. You know, these are, these are only some of the words that describe holiness and separated living. It's a big deal in the New Testament. Look at all the words for it. And those are only half of them, you know. And th this is such a powerful thing because it follows logically. If God has taken me bodily, soul, and spirit, and he has picked me up and separated me from the crowd that's going to hell, and he's put me on a different path that's going to heaven, all he's doing is appealing to me to live consistently with what he's done in my life. I'm a new creature, and I'm going in a different direction. So join the other new creatures in ministry to minister to the world and in our personal lifestyle, let's separate ourselves. Let's come out openly and let's draw lines in the sand where we will not cross so that we're different. And let's make sure that our hearts don't go after the world and be different. Be different. Be weird. If necessary. Okay. I'm just trying to get you to think about it. Right? That's God's word. And I think it's not an option. I think it's a responsibility that we as Christians have. Father, um, there isn't one of us that doesn't make a whole series of choices every day about how we're going to live and what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, what we're going to spend our money on or go, where we're going to, what we're going to listen to, what we're going to watch, the relationships that we cultivate, what we talk about when we're with people and what we don't talk about. And Father... This is the nitty-gritty of living a holy life. You have called us saints. You have made us saints. Saints are holy people, separated from sin, separated from a path that leads to hell, possessed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who wants to cleanse us from the inside. And your appeal is for us to give ourselves over and allow you to transform our mind so that we're no longer conformed to the world in which we live. And you've appealed to us, warned us, don't love it and its things. And to draw a line in the sand, be separated and don't fellowship with darkness and cooperate with it. Father, we need your help. And we ask, I ask, Lord, that you would help each person here, including myself, to consciously yield ourselves moment by moment as we are faced with challenges and temptations to the indwelling spirit that you've given to us, the Holy Spirit, 
that we would have his strength to resist temptation, to resist faltering uh, and going into sinless liaisons and practices that we would stay on the right side of the line, in the light. In Jesus' name, amen.